Well, hello and welcome. I'm really excited that you're able to join us for this week's panel conversation. We have an absolutely great panel um, today uh, that includes three uh, uh, leaders in law enforcement. And um, uh, just based on the conversation that we had kind of coming into this, this session, I know it's going to be just an excellent day to, uh, to, to, to share some ideas and some perspectives. My name is Matt Fulton and I'm the Vice President for National Engagement for Polco. Polco is a company that helps communities with engagement and the tracking performance. Um, and we put together these panel conversations really for the purpose of gathering perspectives from leaders in law enforcement and um, uh, 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 to better understand the ideas and the approaches and, uh, and the things that they're doing in their communities to help with building in engagement and incorporating resident input in the work that they do. The whole purpose behind it is that we really want to share ideas that might help you in the work that you're doing in your communities and um, in the work that is being done around, uh, the, around the, the country in uh, law enforcement. It is such a critical thing that we are, that we are working on. Um, let me uh, kind of tell you how the day is going to go. We'll, uh, we'll introduce the panel here in a second, and then we'll jump into uh, a conversation about putting uh, community input into a, uh, into a community context. <clears throat> and we'll ask our panelists to respond to three different questions. Um, and um, generally, these sessions take about an hour, so we're glad that you're able to participate and, and, uh, and join us today. Let me uh, do some introductions here. Uh, our first panelist is Doreen Jokerst, who is the Chief of Police at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, she leads a department of around 90 employees, um, and she's in this unique position to be able to build a positive relationship between both the university and the city of Boulder. Um, she's also been a police commander in uh, Denver Metropolitan Police Department before going into her current position. She's uh, that, Given that experience, she's been able to command several critical incidents um, uh, ensuring life safety priorities that uh, were at the forefront of the issues that she was dealing with. Uh, Doreen has a master's degree in psychology and a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And she's also completed the Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command, the Senior Management Institute for Police Course and the FBI National Academy. One of the things I really liked, Doreen, when I was reading your bio was um, the pride that you take in building and maintaining positive relationships um, in the community and, and internally, uh, just because it's such an important part of being able to provide fair and impartial policing. Um, with that brief little background, I would love for you to share a little bit more about, uh, about your background. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, uh, for inviting us here and for my ability to participate in this. It's, uh, it's very welcoming. Uh, so that is my background. Most of my time has been spent in municipal law enforcement, but I would say most of my career has been through partnerships with the community and through collaborative processes to make our police departments even better. As you'll see in a lot of my responses and my engagement, I truly believe in a co-production of policing where the community are the police and the police are the community. And without their feedback, their insights and their suggestions for improvement, um, we're missing a large component because we would not be here if it was not for our community. And so again, Matt, thank you so much for having us here and being able to answer some questions uh, to those that we humbly serve. Yeah, thanks, Trina. I actually. Uh... I'm really excited to hear your comments because I, you do have this unique position and there's such a dynamic environment between uh, being on a university campus and those relationships with the, uh, the broader community, especially at being Boulder. So I'm, I'm excited to, to, uh, to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Let me introduce uh, Chief Scott Hughes. Um, Scott actually j started law, his law enforcement career, career back when he was the age of 16, when he joined an Explorer program. Uh, he's now the chief of police in Hamilton Township, which is a, in Warren County in Ohio. Uh, chief Hughes has held a position of Academy Commander and Advanced Law Enforcement Training Coordinator at a regional training facility. And he continues to serve there as a certified instructor through the Ohio, Pe the Ohio Peace Officers Training Commission. Uh, Scott uh, holds a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership and uh, is a graduate of the Supervisor Training and Education Program uh, and the Police Executive Leadership College. Scott's a graduate of the FBI um, Command Institute and is a certified law enforcement executive. Um, uh, Scott, I also love the fact that you're active with the Ohio Association of the Chiefs of Police Association and contributing back to your, um, to your profession in that way. 
um, as well as was impressed that you're a contributing writer and instructor for Caliber Press. So thank you for joining us. And I would love for you to add a little color to that background. Yeah, well, thank you very much for asking me to uh, participate in this. I'm excited. Um, I really just want to say ditto to what uh, Doreen said, because uh, everything that she mentioned, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, as I will also get into in, uh, in these discussion questions. I am a firm believer in having the community involved uh, in policing, and uh, I'm a real big proponent of social media, which I will get into uh, if the opportunity presents itself to include Twitter and a personal Twitter account as a chief, because I think it's important. Um, but yeah, she she really knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, she, she, she took all my thunder from me, what I was going to say. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, I look forward to participating in this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for being here. You know, the one thing that is amazing to me with this panel is all of you have done so much in your backgrounds and um, education and your leadership and providing your skill sets to others. Um, uh, I just think it's great. And so I'm really excited about, about this particular panel. Uh, let me introduce Colonel Jeffrey Katz, uh, who has served as the Chesterfield County Police Chief um, um, uh, since he was appointed in 2018. Uh, he started his law enforcement career back in the the late 80s uh, and served to several communities in Florida, both as a police officer, as well as some experience as a professional firefighter. Uh, so he'll be able to bring that unique perspective as well. Chief Katz has served as a police chief in Boynton Beach Police Department for five years before joining Chesterfield. Um, Jeff has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in business leadership, as well as a doctorate degree in organizational psychology. So he has definitely um, uh, been a lifelong learner uh, during his career. Uh, Jeff's also a, a graduate of the Southern Police Institute Command Officer Development course, the FBI National Academy, and several executive level courses in leadership and management through Harvard and the University of Notre Dame. Um, Chief Katz is also a regularly featured guest lecturer at the FBI National Academy and on behalf of the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police. So uh, that's a very impressive resume, Jeff, and really thankful that you were willing to spend some time with us today. Can you add a little bit more to your background? Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, it, the, I guess it's fortuitous that I, I get to go last because uh, just as Scott said, <laughs> uh, all the, all the thunder has been taken out of the room, but uh, uh, I often speak of, um, of the uh, Peelian tenant. I think it was a seven tenant of the, the police of the public and the public of the, of the police. There is no distinction. I, about every time I speak in public uh, to members of our community, I make sure that I draw that distinction that, that our police service is, uh, is exactly that. It's a service. And we are members of the community. We're not an occupying force in the community. Um, we have the distinction and the honor of spending our full-time careers looking after the welfare and well-being of our community members. Um, but we are part of the community, and so it's essential um, that we reflect uh, and that we build strong, cohesive bonds with those that we serve uh, and truly approach community challenges holistically uh, and as a unified um, you know, organization. Uh, and I think we do that really well. Uh, but there's always room to improve. And I think, as, uh, as I said prior to, to us recording, you know, as we get our feet underneath us uh, coming out of COVID and we start to look and see what, what the world looks like, what our, our respective communities look like, um, it will be a real opportunity, I think, to take a temperature as to, as to the needs of the community and, and reevaluate how we can be responsive to those needs. Yeah, well, law enforcement is facing such unique challenges right now, just kind of given COVID and everything that's happened over the past year that um, uh, it really is great to have all of you here because I think just sharing ideas and perspectives and things that you have found that have worked in your communities is just so valuable for other folks. So, um, so thank you for, to all of you for, for being here. Um, we're gonna be talking today about um, putting police needs and expectations into a community context. You know, I was a city manager for over 30 years and um, I always thought that public safety was uh, one of the most important responsibilities, not only from a public safety standpoint, but just simply from building a community where people um, invest everything that they have. And it's not just financial, it's investment in the community and all aspects of municipal life. But law enforcement is such a critical part of helping people feel safe and feel part of the community. And um, 
so I have just great, re great respect for the complexities and the challenges that law enforcement officials and departments um, uh, are contending with every day. You've got uh, ongoing, complex, challenging uh, issues that are going on all of the time, and the expectations are so high of your departments. Um, if you make a mistake, the impacts uh, are generational. And so that's just how important of a role that you play. And so you're always needing to adapt to community priorities. And, and Chief Katz, you talked about needing to stay on top of what the current values are. That's such a critical thing because what existed, the priorities that existed uh, um, a year ago wouldn't, might not be the priorities that are facing, the communities are facing right now. And so staying on top of those kinds of things is such a critical thing. Um, <clears throat> We actually have a, a survey tool that's called the National Police Services Survey. And um, we actually we administered this a national panel of the survey back in 2018. And then given all of the things that happened over the last couple of years, we actually re-administered the survey uh, nationally to over 2000 people, I think, um, just to get a, a sense for the change in resident sentiment around policing in their communities. And this chart actually shares with you some of the data that we found in terms of resident priorities. Uh, it's really interesting to see some of the shifts. I mean, overall, trust in local law enforcement um, decreased in some respects about 20%. Um, but when you look at the overall shift in priorities, one of the things that actually increased was the importance of building partnerships with the community and building those relationships with your residents so that you do more community problem solving. And so these kind of conversations I think are really important just to understand a little bit better about um, um, what you're doing to build those partnerships and approach community policing in a, in a manner that's reflective of current priorities. Um, it was a really interesting study and when we follow, I'll follow up and give you a full copy of the report that we generated just so you can see some of the data. Um, but um, there's three questions that we're gonna be getting into in today's conversation. The first one is what role should the community play in guiding or influencing the delivery of local police services? The second is what strategies are you using for managing those expectations? And then finally, what tools and methods are you using to just even understand and um, uh, help you track your, um, your the resident priorities regarding the services that you're providing to the community? And so let's, with that, let's just go ahead and kick into the conversation. And um, Chief Jokers, I'd like to start with you. Can, you. can you talk about what role the community plays in guiding um, or influencing the delivery of police services at the university? Uh, yes, thank you so much for that question. So kind of as I said in my introduction, I do strongly believe that the community are the police and the police are the community. And we are here to humbly serve them. And so without the community, we would not be employed and we would not be able to do our profession because we're here because of the community. So to give a little background at the university, the University of Colorado currently has approximately 36,000 students and then about eight to 9,000 faculty and staff. So we almost kind of work like a very small municipality that has its own police department and we have our own community. And so we need to make sure that we are hearing from our community, which is our students, faculty and staff. And a lot of times those questions or what they would like to hear from their police department or the services they would like to receive kind of have some competing interests. But law enforcement cannot continue to assume that we know what's best for our communities. And so we have to engage in those conversations. And for me, that really becomes a co-production. And so when we talk about community policing and we talk about this co-production, it's truly ensuring that we have authentic partnerships and really authentic conversations that benefit both the community and the police and ensuring that they have a voice in defining what police looks like. I would say historically, Police have done a great job of doing things, but we, we have not done a great job is explaining the why. And that really adds to the procedural justice component and the legitimacy component. Why do we do certain things? Why do we make traffic stops? Why do we wear certain things on our uniforms? What does that look like? And so I truly think having these authentic conversations and explaining the why and hearing the feedback from our community and what they would like to see is extremely important. Because a lot of times it's not the crime itself, it's the fear of crime. And so there might be a fear from a certain set of our neighbors and our constituents on what they may presume they believe is happening where the crime stats are somewhere else. And so without those conversations, there's gonna be a disconnect between the community 
and the police department. So another huge piece about that is also educating the public. And to do that, you have to make sure that they're coming to the table on certain things. So maybe explaining why we do certain training or what does that training look like and making sure that we have community input. Maybe it's review of certain policies or procedures or certain municipal ordinances or laws that we have into effect or even having our community sit on the oral boards. Why don't you help us when it comes to hiring those police officers that serve your community? What does that look like? What do you want in a police officer? What are those values that you have and that we have? And so really assuring that the community plays a guiding role is that it is an equal production between the two of us and having those conversations and meeting them in a safe space. At the end of the day, we want our community members to run to us for help and not run away. And so when we have these conversations, maybe certain community members don't feel comfortable meeting at a police department or a government building. And if COVID has taught us anything, certainly like this webinar, we can meet through electronic or virtual means. And so what does a safe space look like and wh where do meetings occur? Can really occur anywhere. And so we have to make sure that we respect that as well, because not everybody is coming to the conversation from the same background, from the same feelings or the same perspectives they may have in law enforcement. And so it's making sure that we meet our community members too in a safe space so that they feel comfortable having the dialogue and the conversation because if that piece is missing then it's missing completely in how we manage and run our police department and so matt that's just a couple of my thoughts and perspectives to answer that question yeah thanks chief um do you have a, uh, because of your unique status as uh being on the university do you have uh like citizen advisory councils that are maybe a partnership I, I love the fact you brought up the partnership aspect but between the university and the city generally to help kind yeah. of get people involved yes we do and so the uh, city of boulder has an oversight board and the university is going to be launching in the fall a community oversight review board which actually took approximately nine months and it was a lot of collaboration between our students faculty and staff coming together through a task force to really answer the questions what do you want to see in policing what does that look like and a lot of the responses were data transparency having a voice having some insight and so we're really excited about this process that's launching forward for us this fall and i'm looking forward to see how that comes to fruition for us that's great thank you so much chief hughes can you talk about the role that the community plays in guiding or influencing the delivery of police services in hamilton township so am I allowed to just say ditto for the entire webinar or do I, do I actually have to have to give a response? Yeah, you have uh, to give a response. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I'll just say this. I agree with everything uh, she just said. Um, we are in a unique position here, as I stated to the panel prior to this beginning. Um, I am a suburb of a large city, uh, Cincinnati. Uh, we're the next county away. Um, so the, the, the demands for policing where I am compared to what the media shows every night on the news are different. Um, having said that, we still have our place and, and we are a, uh, a, a big proponent, if you will, of engaging our community through our uh, social media, as I alluded to just a few minutes ago. Uh, when I became a chief here five years ago, we had basically zero presence on any social media platform. And uh, that was one of the things that I promised uh, my bosses that I wanted to implement. And it's, it's now obviously gained a lot of traction in five years. And it has, it has been just, the, I think, one of the best things we've done. And I think, you know, the role that they play is done through how responsive they are to what we post on, on social media which I think we'll come back to later on in one of the other questions, but I'll also say this, I think the elected officials in the township play a role also because they are basically the voice for the people, right? They're elected by the people to represent them at, at meetings and, and our guidance and kind of how, how we police in a township in Ohio is from our board of trustees. Uh, so that, that's, that's a balancing act as well. Um, uh, because it's, it's unique because it's, you know, I report to trustees. There's no, there's nobody in between there. So uh, that can be, that can be interesting. But having said that, um, uh, I think again, uh, Doreen said <laughs> everything that I would have said with, 
with much more uh, uh, couth. So, yeah. Scott, um, uh, in the township, do you does your elected body have a um, an established strategic plan, and does the community get engaged much with that strategic thinking? Yeah, great question. So they actually did just release a five year um, comprehensive plan. However, I'll tell you, Matt, that was more for economic development and growth. It did not really get into public safety. Um, we are one of the fastest growing communities in the state. Uh, so our challenges are infrastructure based, if you will, roads, bridges. Uh, we're very close to the interstate, uh, but we're kind of uh, we're bottlenecked by a couple two lane bridges to get to where we are located. So most of the strategic plan was done on the economic development side and zoning. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief Katz, can you talk about the role that the public plays in uh, guiding and influencing the delivery of local police services in Chesterfield County? Absolutely, Matt. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's essential. And I think, um, again, yeah, it is hard to follow Doreen because that was an outstanding answer. And Scott, I appreciate your contribution as well. Um, you know, I think we, you know, we have a strategic plan as a county. Uh, it's called Blueprint Chesterfield and uh, safe neighborhoods and, and communities are, are one of our key strategic uh, objectives. Uh, we recognize as a county that, um, you know, I think, Matt, as you said earlier, um, from an economic development standpoint, people aren't going to invest uh, their money. They're not going to invest their time, their energy, their effort uh, and their lives in communities where they don't feel safe. So, I think as law enforcement professionals, we, we really, uh, we deal with two things. We deal with crime and we deal with the fear of crime. And those, those two metrics are really uh, addressed in different ways. In dealing with crime, we of course wish to work to suppress crime, identify criminals, conduct investigations, uh, make sure that we're abiding by uh, everyone's civil liberties and that we're doing it within the scope of the law uh, and that we're holding people to account for violating uh, the rights of others and violating, you know, uh, you know others in general, uh, victimization. Uh, the fear of crime really relates more to the efficacy a community has with their police department. It's more related to the, the nature and quality of the relationships that we build uh, with, with those in our community. So we do a couple of things in Chesterfield that I'm uh, exceptionally proud of, one of which is uh, we do our uh, citizen academies. Uh, we have our own police academy in Chesterfield County. And so we run a number of uh, both daytime and evening academies throughout the year. Um, those citizen academies that we, that we run are about 12 or 13 weeks. Uh, we, sometimes we focus them on students. Sometimes um, we focus them on the elderly and we call it our senior academy. Um, we actually even held a legislative academy this last year for uh, persons who serve in our uh, General Assembly who were uh, looking at uh, police reform legislation. We wanted to bring them in and help them understand what is qualified immunity and how does it impact law enforcement? What would the stripping of qualified immunity do in terms of impacting service deliverables uh, to their constituency? Uh, so, you know, kind of give them a full picture. Uh, so we do our Citizens Academies. We do our National Night Out. I think last year, Chesterfield County was ranked fourth in the nation for agencies that serve populations of over 300,000 uh, in terms of community engagement. Uh, we like one night a week to go out and party with our community. And uh, we love that our community loves to come out and do it with us. Um, but we're, we, we have a robust social media presence. Um, that was something that, um, that when I came here uh, a little over three and a half years ago, you know, I really wanted to emphasize, we have a number of people who are on the road, watch commanders uh, that are on the road, that are on Twitter, that are giving real-time information to people about road closures. Um, we're continually engaging with the public. Uh, and when they thank us, we thank them. We put information out. We tell our story. Uh, and I think that's, that's something that's important. Um, in this day and age where there's a hyper-criticism toward law enforcement and the work we do. There's no tolerance for any bad outcomes whatsoever, which is not a realistic expectation in life uh, because we always, come to the, we always come to the bad situations, right? Uh, but we recognize that in any scenario, in any population, 10% of the population is going to hate you no matter what, 10% is going to love you no matter what, and that fight is for that middle 80, right, in the middle. Um, 
we don't spend a lot of time working to appease the, the folks that are going to hate us no matter what. And there are plenty of people out there right now who want us to apologize for arresting people and holding people to account who violate others. I got into this profession to protect people who could not protect themselves. I got into this protection, uh, into this profession uh, to protect victims. And what we're seeing right now societally is a process by which we are taking people who have chosen to offend against others and, and describing them as victims. Um, can law enforcement do it better? Yes. Uh, and I think we continue to improve as a profession. Uh, and I think we will continue to improve. Um, but we can't lose sight of those folks who are being victimized by predators. And that is happening in our communities. Um, and we can't apologize for that. Um, we, we are principled. Uh, we perform a noble job. And I think that it's important that we tell our story. We use social media to do it. Uh, we use press conferences to do it. Uh, we need to engage the community and have that relationship. The members of our community love us and we love them, but it's because we have built that foundation of trust uh, that is essential. That's great. Um, um, very well said. I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, just you do a lot of engagement. It's very clear through all of the things that you do. Did you notice at all whether or not your engagement levels changed much during uh, the pandemic over the last couple of years? Uh, it it definitely did. Um, and because we address things that otherwise we would not have addressed. For example, as we saw schools beginning to ramp down and we saw children uh, spending more time at home, uh, we like to think that all children are safest in their homes. But, you know, the statistics and our experiences bear out other, other outcomes. We know that, for, for example, some children are most in danger when they're at home and they don't have access to school counselors and teachers and, and school resource officers. Um, so as we started seeing the schools ramp down, we started reminding members of our community, hey, look out for your neighbors, look out for your neighbor's kids. Um, you know, if you see something that's unusual or that you're concerned about, please reach out to us and let us know. We changed the nature of our messaging. Um, we had a lot of people that were concerned about uh, our governor's executive orders about wearing masks and things of that nature and whether it was legal and constitutional. And what was the role of law enforcement in, in addressing those issues? Um, and so we communicated with our, with our public about that, about what our uh, legal obligations were and what our intent was. Okay. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Let's move on to the second question. And uh, Chief Hughes, I'd like to start with you. Can, you. can you share with us some of the strategies that you're using for helping to manage resident expectations in the township? Yeah, sh sure. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to sound like a, a repeat record here, but I think for me, it's, 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 it's the social media component again. I think monitoring social media tells us a lot as law enforcement executives about the temperature of the community. Um, as, as Chief Katz pointed out, you're, you know, you're 10% on either side of the spectrum. Let's look at the 80% in the middle. Um, I know, and, and we all know on this call that any post I put out, I know I'm going to have a couple folks that are going to be on both sides, but really reading that, that middle and our, are we hearing positive feedback? Are we hearing that, hey, this this was beneficial or thanks for sharing or, you know, whatever that message is. I think for me, that tells me that my community here in, in Hamilton Township is happy um, with what's going on. I, I do want to circle back to one of the uh, comments that Chief Katz made about uh, uh, the pandemic and, and how it changed things. I know one, one thing that we did early on, and I think a lot of departments have done this, is we put a lot more, I shouldn't say a lot more, we put a couple more resources online, um, you know, online reporting uh, ability, things like that to keep our officers from having to, you know, have face-to-face -face contact with folks. And I think um, that that did a lot for us too. It showed that we cared about them, we cared about our employees, and it was another tool that we were able to, we were able to use. Um, you know, HOA meetings, the Citizens Police Academies, if I see the enrollment numbers continue to go up and the demand continue to be there, um, that tells me that we're doing something right. Uh, again, 2020 was obviously kind of the, the oddity there, but 
we're getting ready to do a junior police academy here in a couple of weeks. And I was going to be lucky if we got 10, we almost have two dozen. So for us, that's great. So I think that that shows that the community is, is really appreciating, again, what we're doing. Are there any unique aspects that come to play in your world um, just because of how fast we're growing? Um, you know, that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. We, uh, we did some little things like put our, put our um, you know, Twitter handle, Facebook handle, Instagram handle, all of our business cards. I want to put it on our cars so people can see it so that they know that they know we're out there. Um, stuff like that, but no, I don't. I don't think we've had any major challenges. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, yeah. uh -huh. Chief Katz. Can you talk about the strategies that you're using in Chesterfield County for managing resident expectations? Sure. Absolutely. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a fairly robust Citizen Academy uh, program, and along with that, we've created a, a Citizen Academy Alumni Association. We have about 800 members of our community who are part of that alumni association. Uh, so we tap into that alumni association an awful lot. The county also has a government academy, uh, and they have an association as well. Uh, one of the other things that we that we do, and and I take no credit for this. Our, our my predecessor actually created this um, uh, back around the time where uh, the, the the country was in, in upheaval over the the Ferguson uh, incident, and at that time. Um, he created uh, something that we call the Community Partners Breakfast, and I've been proud to carry that tradition on because I think it makes a, a heck of a lot of sense, and we have found that it has borne great fruit. And essentially what we do with, with our Community Partners Breakfast is we identify community groups within Chesterfield County, and we invite them. And these are, these are groups like our, our Chesterfield uh, uh, NAACP, um, our uh, Virginia Muslim Association, uh, members of our LGBTQI community, the people who have historically been marginalized or left out of the conversation when it comes to law enforcement policy and practice and procedure. We develop relationships. We invite um, uh, our community partners to breakfast and we have our local pastors come, you know, anybody's invited. Um, but we make special emphasis to invite people who historically have literally not been at the table and ask them to come to the table and, and engage us in robust conversations. And sometimes the priorities and the expectations uh, are in conflict among members of that, are, that are at the, at the table. But I think there's value in that because we break bread together. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have robust discussions, we develop relationships, we see each other as more than just special interest groups, uh, and operators within our community, but as human beings, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, uh, and, fellow members of the same community who all want what's best for the community. We may have different paths to get there, but all of us really want the same outcome, right? We want low crime, we want high quality of life, we want just and equal treatment of, of, of members of our community. So the Community Partners Breakfast, I think has really been uh, a, big, a big help. That's outstanding. <clears throat> yeah, that, what a creative way to build community. That's a, uh, congratulations on that. I'm also really impressed with your alumni group coming out of the academies, uh, you have kind of built in cheerleaders for the community that have got a context around it. And so uh, between the Citizen Academy and the Government Academy, uh, that's just wonderful. Uh, uh, that's a great job. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks. Um, Chief Jokers, can you talk about the strategies that you're using at the university for managing community expectations? Yes, thank you for that question. And I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, both chiefs said previous to me in regards to everything that they are doing in their uh, communities as well. So when I look at strategies and managing community expectations, for me, it kind of boils down to two things, communication and transparency. And so when I talk about communication, I do agree it is having a robust social media platform. Here at the university, we do have roughly 36,000 students. And so what I was noticing was sometimes our robust social media platforms was actually not where the students were going to get their information. And so it was making sure that is in alignment. And so that's something we're currently working on because as you know, that is always ever faceted. So we think it might be Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but if all the students are going somewhere else for their information, we have to make sure that we meet them in that space as well. 
And so communication can be done through social media and kind of getting that dialogue going and seeing the responses and seeing what that looks like. Because I do agree, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will. And there's a lot of amazing things we're doing in law enforcement. And there's a lot of areas that we still need to work on and still need to improve. And so it's showcasing and highlighting those things while talking about all the things that need to be worked on and improved and making sure that we engage our community with those dialogues to help us along the way. Um, another way that can be done is through community meetings and stakeholder groups. And so currently on campus, we have roughly just under 500 different student organizations. And so it is making sure that we are reaching out to our underrepresented populations that have normally not had a seat at the table to get their input, solicit their feedback. And so we work with our student organizations, our faculty organizations and our staff organizations to try and engage in those conversations and those dialogues and really strengthening those relationships. Um, during COVID and through all of that, although our community engagement changed and went down, I challenged our department to say, well, this is not a time to shy away from community policing. And so what innovative ways can we do that? So it was through virtual means. And then I did have an officer say, chief, we're not doing ride alongs anymore. Can we do walk alongs? We do have a beautiful university and we can spread out. And so instead of doing that, can we have someone walk with us on campus where we can showcase and highlight different things? And so it was really my staff coming up with innovative and different things that we are doing here on campus to continue that community engagement that that might not be historically how we have done our ride along program. And with social media, a great thing we have here too is students. And so we employ several students here at our police department who usually are the ones coming to me saying, hey, I saw this over here or during we can do this better or, or here's what's going on here. And so I love that collaborative process and that insight um, because they definitely know where they're getting their information and what that looks like. And so other than communication, I think it's transparency. And what does that look like? Sharing our data with the community on a variety of different things. Maybe that's our response to resistance calls, or maybe that's if we've received bias-based profiling complaints, or what does our recruitment and hiring statistics look like? And where are we losing applicants out of our process and what are it means to change those things? And so having those things also shared provides insight to someone to come in and say, hey, I, I read this in your report. Have you guys ever thought of this or have you changed this or what does this look like and so I think that is extremely important and really just asking the community what information they have I am hoping within the next year we can launch on a citizen police academy I believe that is a great way to showcase and highlight and educate those on what a police department does and what they do from every facet and so I do think a community uh, citizens police academy, it was done very well in my last agency. And it's something I would like to bring here at the university, not just for our students, but also our faculty and staff as well, because they have questions too on why do police do certain things? Why does it look like this? Is all policing the same? At the end of the day, there's approximately 33,000 different police organizations throughout the United States. So things are not done all the same and they have different standards of what that looks like. And so I think better we can educate and work together, the better it is to help answer these questions that have been pending for so long. Chief, you had shared with me earlier the, the, the positive relationship that you have with the police chief in Boulder. Mm -hmm. And as you, I, I totally agree with you on the transparency issue and the sharing of data. Do you work closely with the city on kind of melding your databases together so that you're both working really, really closely together on responding, planning, strategic, strategically thinking about those issues that are impacting both entities in a, in a common but kind of unique way? Yeah, so that's a very great question. Great question. Actually, the university and the city of Boulder just entered into both our police departments, a data sharing agreement. And so we currently run off the same CAD system throughout all of Boulder County. And so through this data sharing agreement, they'll get our records management system. And so that we're able to pre-populate and send out to our community, not only CUPD's data and the calls for service in which they go to, but also the city of Boulder. The unique thing the city of Boulder has, which I think is, is phenomenal, is the chief that they hired in was the chief of police for the University of Cincinnati prior to uh, coming there. So she understands that relationship between a university and a city. And I think that has really helped strengthen the relationship that both the city and the university have, which was extremely positive. It has helped build that and extend even further. And so, yes, it is a very uh, strong partnership and collaboration. And we're definitely moving things forward, not only here at the university, but the community as a whole. That's outstanding. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
Let's move on to the final question. And uh, Chief Katz, I'd like to start with you. Um, can you talk about the tools and the methods that you're using to understand what the resident expectations are and what their priorities are regarding uh, the needs for law enforcement? I'll tell you the number one tool that I use, and it's, uh, it's pretty antiquated at this point. It's this. Uh, every time I do a community forum, every time I speak publicly, uh, whether it's to a civic organization uh, or a presentation to the community, I give everyone in my community my cell phone number. Uh, everyone in my department has it, and that's over 700 people. Everyone in the community uh, that I speak with has it. The number one way that I can keep tabs on what the needs and expectations of the community are, are to be accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, you'd be surprised in a community of this size, uh, people don't abuse that number, uh, but they do call when they have a concern or an issue. Uh, again, you know, uh, I have a social media presence. I have a Facebook page. I have a LinkedIn page where, where we connected. Uh, and, a, and I have a Twitter account as well. So people can reach out to me via social media. They can reach out to me via cell phone. Uh, if they want to just reach out to the department, we have a, uh, a hotline that they can call. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, an email address that someone can send an anonymous uh, tip to or information or a concern. Um, and, uh, I, I, and I think, again, you know, having those relationships with our alumni, having the relationships with our community partners and from the community partner breakfast, and just making yourself accessible and available to people. People want to be able to pick up the phone and call their police chief and say, I have a concern or I have an issue. Uh, and, you know, and the number one thing that I hear in our community is people concerned about speeding on their street. I mean, that is the number one complaint. And, uh, you know, I know, Doreen, you're in a university, but uh, in your previous municipal life, I'm sure that, that you could relate to that. And Scott, I'm sure, even though you're in Ohio and I've never been to Ohio, you're probably dealing with the same issue. You know, people are people. And I, and I think that the value here is recognizing that, and I think Matt, you said it earlier, you know, most people don't care about public safety until it impacts them. They're not interested in the number of traffic fatalities in a community or the number of homicides in a community until something happens on their street that disrupts their world, and then they want an immediate resolution and, and they want the problem solved. And the, the, the mitigating strategy there is to have that relationship and have that trust before that point comes where they want something done, where you can have a, uh, you know, a conversation, an honest dialogue with somebody and say, look, you know, I appreciate that you were concerned about speeding on your street. We'll set up a smart trailer. We'll do a study. We'll, we'll learn uh, whether or not uh, the, the, the issue that you're seeing is perceived or if there's objective data to support it. Uh, in the meantime, you know, we've had 35 traffic fatalities in our county and we're currently working in those areas that people are dying. Uh, and, you know, and we hope your street's not going to be one of them. But, um, you know, I think having those honest conversations with people, uh, that goes a long way. Yeah, I really respect that. Um, I think you bring up really an important point on the value of, I mean, you, you're doing excellent work in building engagement in the community through all of the different venues. But as a result of that, you're building up that trust bank and, and uh, making those connections so that people have enough faith and confidence in the department uh, that they're not abusing the opportunity to reach out to you or to others in your department. So I think the, the message that I really love to hear is um, build that engagement, build that trust up, build those positive community relationships so that they, um, they have trust in the work that you're doing and trust in the way the community is going and, and trust that their investment is well spent. So um, yeah, yeah, very well said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chief Jokers, can you talk about the tools and methods that you're using to understand um, student and resident expectations um, and priorities on the campus? Yes, thank you for that. And I would like to echo, I agree with what Jeff says in regards to being available and making sure that you're there for the community in which you serve. And I would also add on that you have to be approachable. There's a number of times that just the wearing of the uniform or having the title of chief can be seen as uh, scary or unknown to certain people. You see that internally where people say, I didn't think I could reach out to you. I, you're the chief. I had to go this way. Well, you see it with the community too. I didn't know 
know that I could call you or ask for help. You're the chief. And so it's that approachability and kind of lessening that stigma of we are here to help you and we run an organization and I want to make sure that I hear from our community itself and not through the layers of what are your concerns and what would you like to see done differently and what does that look like? And so it's availability and it's approachability as well and, and melding and tying those two things together. And so I would just reiterate authentic conversations with our students, with our faculty and our staff, answering questions and answering our limitations. Maybe we can't do something because there's a law put into place or a municipal ordinance or there's university policy for the reasons why we can't do certain things, but people don't know that. They just don't understand why it wasn't done. And so sometimes when you manage expectations, you also have to manage what our limitations are and can we change that? Is it something the community can change or help us with? Sometimes it's just an unknown. And when people don't know something or they don't see a result, then a lot of times they see the negative. Well, the police must not be doing this because it didn't happen and not understand, well, they actually couldn't do this and here's the reasons why. And so I do think education is one of those huge pieces on both sides. It's not just educating the public, but the police also be ed also becoming educated on their thoughts, perspectives, and their feelings associated with what they're going through and what they would like to see done differently. Um, we do have a number of active student organizations and faculty organizations. And so it's really reaching out to them and saying, can I come to your meetings? Do you guys have any questions? Are you talking about anything in any of your classes as it relates to law enforcement that you want the chief or a member of my command staff or a police officer to be there to engage in those conversations and, and to work with our students and answer those things? A challenge we have is our community a lot of times turns over every four years. I think by the time we get students and we're developing these relationships, they graduate and I just hope that we did a good job working through those and really creating a partnership. So then when my students become residents in the other two chiefs uh, municipalities, then hopefully I've already established a great working relationship with them and with law enforcement and having this co-production and education on both sides. And lastly, as I indicated, we are starting a community oversight review board in the fall. And I just think this is really a great way to have our community read our strategic plan for our police department. What do we think about that? What does it look like? Read maybe different training programs that we're doing, such as ICAT when it comes to use of force and what our verbal de-escalation and verbal persuasion looks like and can they participate in that? And then having them even more participate in hiring or oral boards or solicit that feedback. And so I really think it is a co-production and without the community and without their insight, we're missing a large component of policing and, and how it should be. And I really appreciated you bringing up um, the approachability aspect because uh, that's one of the real benefits of having these panel conversations. You're able to deliver uh, a message uh, and a conversation to folks who are gonna hear you and I think that's one of the really important aspects of law enforcement that sometimes gets lost, that approachability issue, because, you know, in many respects, uh, you're residents of the community, you're, um, uh, you are part of the community. Well, you had brought it up earlier, you know, the community is the police and the police is the community. So uh, very well stated. Do you, just a question, within your, on the, on the student campus, uh, it, within your strategic plan, do you have any metrics that are in place to kind of track how safe students feel on campus? Um, that you kind of monitor over time? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question because a lot of times students ask me, they say, Chief, do you know all the crime that happens on campus? And I said, how do you think I'll answer that? And the students usually say, well, the answer has to be no. And I said, the answer is no. And I wouldn't know all the crime on campus because maybe our underrepresented students don't feel comfortable reaching out to the police to tell me there's crime. And so that's kind of when we talk about and what Jeff brought up too, the fear of crime. I know where the stats are gonna show. I know where our officers have been called to. And I know what we can affect change there and what we can do predictive policing and evidence-based policing and try and reduce that. But my fear is the crimes that I don't know about. For those students that don't feel comfortable explaining that to the police or coming forward and not having that voice. And so kind of like the officers explained, uh, the chiefs on this call explained what their why was. That's the same to mine, leaving the community better than I found it and speaking for the victims that don't have a voice. And so when I hear that there could be victims on our campus that don't feel comfortable sharing that information, then that's something our police department can't help with. And those are things that keep me up at night. And so building those relationships and making sure people run to us for help and not run away is something I'll continue to do as the chief here at the university. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate that. 
Uh, Chief Hughes, can you talk about the tools and methods that you're using for understanding resident expectations and priorities? Absolutely. Thank you for letting me go last on this conversation because uh, I get the fall, fall back on my favorite word, which is ditto. Um, one, one thing I will add is uh, as far as accessibility, you know, two weekends ago, I, I was asked uh, by the local Little League to throw out the first pitch for opening day for the uh, Little League. And there was a conflict in my schedule, but I, I, I told my wife, I said, I have to do this uh, because I just know how much this community supports us. And uh, I think as, as a leader in law enforcement, you, you have to be willing to make those sacrifices and readjust your schedule because to, to all those kids and the 150 parents and children that were at that field that day, um, when I threw out that first pitch and that, and, and, and it was a strike or we're calling it a strike. Um, when that when that pitch was delivered and that and everybody cheered and, and applauded, uh, I mean, there's no greater feeling to to be the leader in a community that supports us the way that they do. Um, and I want to take that accessibility conversation one step further. Uh, every one of my uh, supervisors uh, has their own Twitter handle, um, which I think is important because I can't be here 24/7. Uh, and it's, it's interesting how they have certain followers um, who latch on to them for, for various reasons. And that's OK, because they're still just, you know, a representative of the, of the department and they're part of my command staff. So but no, I think Jeff and Doreen hit hit everything uh, very well um, that, that I would add. Uh, I think uh, I like the cell phone comment, uh, uh, Jeff. I think that that's important um, because you know, be like being the CEO of a Procter and Gamble or of GE, uh, you know, you're the police chief. And I think there's some people who just think, Hey, we can't talk to him because he's the CEO when in fact, no, we, we want you to talk to us. So. Yeah. Scott, do you have uh, in your strategic plans, do you have any metrics that you follow in terms of just getting a sense for where residents heads are on their priorities that you kind of track over time? You know, because we're growing so fast, Everything that we're following is is what was mentioned before, which is where are the crashes, where are the car break-ins, where are the thefts from construction uh, sites, because that's the issues that we're dealing with right now. So we're pretty data-driven. Uh, fortunately, we're the 13th safest community in Ohio by by uh, some companies that publish stats. So we uh, we just follow the data right now. Yeah, you know, you're, you are in such an interesting dynamic because you are growing so fast. Issues impacting your department change every day. Um, and while there are those universal speed in the neighborhood kind of issues, uh, you're always being confronted with new things that are impacting either your business community or your residential neighborhoods. So uh, you do live in a, you do, you do live and work in really kind of a unique and uh, vibrant kind of an environment. So um, I'm definitely. I'm definitely the odd man out in this conversation because uh, I, I, I can respect what Chief Katz is going through in the large of the department. Then I also can have an appreciation for university policing in general. Uh, and then there's me. So <laughs> it's certainly interesting. That's for sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for all of these comments and all of these perspectives. This has been a great conversation, a lot of just great ideas. I'm just kind of curious if anybody has anything else that you want to add to the conversation or questions for each other. I think I, I, if I could, I'd just like to add some uh, something else that I, I think kind of a perspective that we, that we take here in, in Chesterfield. Uh, we're always looking for what we can do next to improve the quality of our services. When we have uh, recruits come into our academy and whenever I speak to the members of the community, I always tell them that we strive to be the Ritz-Carlton of police departments. And when I say that, I mean that if you had a choice as to what police department you would call after you're done interacting with us, I want you to, to have the sense that I would call them again no matter where I was, no matter what I was facing. They owned my issue. They worked through it professionally. They were prompt. They were they were responsive. They were competent. They were capable. They were kind, uh, and um, you know. And I feel I was well served. And that is our cultural expectation. We are a first choice community. That's that's what we espouse. It's on the bottom of all of our letterheads. Um, but it is more than just what we say. It's how we conduct ourselves on every call with every community interaction. Um, so we're always looking for the next 
best thing that we can do in terms of service. So we've brought in uh, seven volunteers to, um, to vet our applicants and sit down and do oral review uh, panels with our command staff to look at our background investigations and, and ask, is there anything that you'd like us to check out more? How do you feel about this candidate and this? I'm not a big supporter. In fact, I'm not at all a supporter of use of force uh, oversight by civilians. If you've never been punched in the nose, you really aren't in a position to make a determination of how somebody should act who is professionally trained in dealing with that such scenario. But there is a place to bring members of the community into a department and engage them and have them take a look at our hiring practices. Who is who are we putting in those positions in the first place, right? Um, and the other thing is we've, we're rolling out a new program uh, next month. It's called Spider Tech. And I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it basically provides uh, callers a survey that they can take at the conclusion of their call for service uh, from their cell phone. And it gives them the ability to, to rank and rate how we delivered our services and how they feel about uh, how we did. I'm looking forward to taking that information and overlaying those data onto a map and determining where our customer satisfaction is high and where it is low, and then actually making overt efforts to build community trust in areas where our satisfaction delivery uh, outputs are less than optimal. Um, I think that's a new and innovative approach. Again, we're gonna, we'll be the first department in Virginia to use this platform. Um, but it, I think it puts us at a level of customer service that is uh, beyond what is normal. Uh, and it's not the last great thing that we're going to do. It's just the next great thing that we're going to do. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, um, that, sounds really, that sounds really pretty cool and interesting. Um, Scott, Green, anything that either of you want to add? Um, I would just add, and I think it's a little kind of a variance off the topic, is something historically law enforcement agencies have not done well is robust wellness programs for our employees. And so when we talk about it, you know, I think hurt people hurt people. And so, you know, if I come down on people and I don't create a psychologically safe environment for our officers and our staff, that's going to uh, go out into the community, right? That's going to coincide into how the officers treat the community because that's how we treat our staff and everything that's going on in law enforcement. And so I think having a robust wellness program and something we can do a lot better, even in my own police department, to make sure that our officers and our staff do feel psychologically safe in the jobs in which they do, having resources available to them. Because as we talk about strategic plans that we have written, to me, that's merely just words on paper that will never get carried out if you don't have the staff willing to carry it out to make the community and everything better that's on there. And so making sure that we do better as a profession when it really comes to wellness programs for those that work within our police departments. Yeah, very well stated and, and such a critical point to bring up. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, let me, uh, <clears throat> I tell you, um, I have just absolutely loved this conversation today. And let me say as a city manager, um, I would have absolutely welcomed you to be working in, in my communities uh, and running our police departments. So thank you. Uh, just really, really outstanding conversations and the work that you're doing is just really, really impressive. I love the fact all of you have a priority around the whole issue of engagement and in, including your residents in the uh, kind of guiding the way the police to, police services are, are being uh, delivered in your communities. I love the engagement um, with the, the citizen academies and um, uh, all of the, just the kind of the outreach work and the accessibility issues. Uh, it's just really, really impressive. You know, we all recognize the value of social media and uh, that's such an important part, especially during the pandemic, but it doesn't take away from the walk-alongs or the, you know, the things that you're doing on the street with the people adapting to the situation that we all confronted this last year. And um, so just thank you for just great, great comments and great perspectives and new ideas. I'm really looking forward to, to uh, sharing all of this stuff with other people that will benefit from it. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just kind of share uh, a little bit with what will happen now. Um, um, I will send you a follow-up letter with introductions to each other in case you want to reach out. You all come from kind of unique and different spaces, but uh, with universal responsibilities. So um, uh, I'll look forward to getting you all connected with each other. And we do this panel conversation every week. 
Uh, and so if you have colleagues or people that you think would be uh, interested and uh, uh, provide good input, uh, let me know. I'd, I'd welcome them to be get on a panel conversation and, uh, and to share their ideas. So thanks for uh, kind of helping to build the panel going forward. Um, we will we'll publish these uh, highlight segments from your conversations on LinkedIn, uh, probably within the next week. And so you'll start seeing them come your way and certainly welcome you to push those out to your network so that other people can, can take advantage and learn from you as well. That's what this is all, all about. Um, and then finally, I would, I'll look forward to connecting with each of you just to get some feedback on what we can do to make these panels better. And uh, uh, certainly love to tap into any experience in your expertise on on delivering messages and running these kind of conversations and programs. So thank you for any feedback and, and ideas that you have. Uh, let me just kind of close by just thanking you. Uh, this has been an outstanding conversation. Uh, all of you are very articulate and are dedicated to the communities and the work that you're doing. Um, and um, just really appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us. So um, with that, I will just wish you the best of luck and with everything that you're doing and uh, Look forward to connecting with you at some point in the future <clears throat> and um, wish you well. Thank, thank you very you much. Scott, thank Doreen, you. it was a pleasure. Yes, yeah. thank you guys. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Thank you for meeting you. Really appreciate meeting all of you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.